That song, Praise the King, asks, begins with a question or, or the statement, there's a reason. And singing that song just now with all of you, wherever you are, whether you're joining us on Facebook uh, or on YouTube or our, our website, we're just glad you're with us. And I was thinking about it as we sang that song, Hallelujah, He's Alive. You know, there's lots of reasons right now in the world to doubt that, to question it, or to feel like, I don't feel like praising, I don't feel like singing. I've talked to many people over the last seven months during COVID who were closed up during the pandemic when we were quarantining, sheltering in place, feeling claustrophobic, struggling with mental health, depression. And then those that are struggling to keep their kids together and do online schooling and hold down a job or lost a job, despairing over the racial tensions in our country, fearful about the coming election and what will happen on either side. There's lots of reasons to think, I don't, I don't feel like rejoicing or praising, but when we do, something good happens, and that's at the heart of what we want to talk about here today together. So let's pray and ask God to speak to us because we really need to hear from him. Lord God, we do acknowledge that there is a reason we gather, there is a reason for our worship, there is a reason for our church, there's a reason for our hope. And that reason has a name, it's you, Lord Jesus. So we ask you, Jesus, our reason and our hope and our king to speak to us through your word. We pray it in your name. Amen. Well, we're in a series called Choosing Joy. If you've not been with us, I encourage you to go back and listen to these sermons. Particularly last week, Pastor Sterling preached a brilliant sermon. uh, And I would just encourage you to go back and listen to that one if you missed it. It was just last week. Uh, This series is really a study of the book of Philippians. Philippians is a letter, a New Testament letter the Apostle Paul wrote to a group of Christians, to a church in a city called Philippi. Philippi was in Macedonia. In fact, some of the earliest Christians in the church of Philippi, the Philippian Christians, were some of the first converts converts to faith in Jesus on the continent of Europe. Paul led many of these people to faith in Jesus himself. He helped to start this church. He knows these people intimately and loves them. And he writes to them this letter to encourage them. And the theme of the letter is joy. Joy in Christ. Joy in the Lord. And ironically, beautifully, Paul writes this letter of joy from prison. We've talked about that in the past. And the passage we're going to examine today, Paul uses a phrase that shows up repeatedly throughout the last couple of chapters of Philippians. Of course, Paul didn't write with chapters, but it shows up at the end of the letter repeatedly. It's the phrase, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. I don't know about you, but if you grew up in the church, then maybe you remember a song we used to sing. If you didn't, you wouldn't know this song necessarily, but rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. and It's a round where you repeat it over and over again. And I can't say that phrase, rejoice in the Lord, without, it, it sounds churchy. It sounds Christian-y, doesn't it? Oh, rejoice in the Lord. Let's just rejoice in the Lord. And sometimes I think people who maybe are outside the Christian bubble hear phrases like that and they think, well, this is just another way that Christians stick their head in the sand and ignore all the pain in the world. Or it's another way that Christians have their head in the clouds. They're like, they're not paying attention. I understand why it feels that way and why it might sound that way to you. But I hope that by the time we're done, together in our time in in God's word, you never hear or say the phrase rejoice in the Lord the same way again. Because there is great power in rejoicing in the Lord when we understand what Paul's really saying. It has to do with Paul, what he means uh, here in this text. So I'm gonna read to you from Philippians chapter three, verses one through 11. Uh, I usually often read from the English Standard Version, but I'm reading from the New International Version today because there's a couple of translation quirks that I think are just better or more helpful. So let's read from Philippians chapter 3 verses 1 through 11. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. There it is, that phrase. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard to you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. But whatever gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. 
for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain the resurrection of the dead. This is such an incredible passage, and we're only going to scratch the surface of it. Paul says this phrase in the beginning, Rejoice in the Lord, and it's no trouble for me to write these things to you. They are a safeguard for you. How is rejoicing in the Lord a safeguard for us? What in the world does Paul mean by that? Well, for one thing, he doesn't just mean your head in the clouds thinking happy thoughts all the time. In fact, Paul goes in verse 1 from rejoice in the Lord. I'll say it. I rejoice. Later in chapter 4, he says, I'll say it again and again. Rejoice. He goes from verse 1, rejoice in the Lord, to verse 2, watch out for those dogs. <laughs> what? I mean, it's like a weird, it's like you're getting a text from somebody with a bunch of flower emojis and rainbow emojis and heart emojis and prayer hands emojis, and all of a sudden, all caps, watch out for those dogs. You'd think, this is a weird mood shift, Paul. What happened? What's going on? Why the mood swing? What's Paul talking about? Who are the dogs? He's referring to a specific group of teachers, false teachers, known as the Judaizers. Visiting teachers who claimed to be Christians, but were emphasizing the need for Jewish converts to faith in Jesus to hold on to their Jewish identity, and for Gentile converts, non-Jews, to faith in Jesus to adopt some Jewish identity. The question basically swirling around in that day was, how Jewish did you have to be to be a follower of Jesus? That sounds like an odd question for us. But we in our day also import all kinds of things into what it means to be Christian in America. In the Old Testament, God gives his people certain specific identity markers that set them apart from other nations. Things like Sabbath keeping, dietary laws, and circumcision, among others. They were critical for the Jewish identity, specifically when the Jews were taken captive, to hold on to their identity when they were in foreign lands. It marked them as God's people. It's how they knew they were distinct. These things became very, very important to the Jewish identity, and they were very serious about them. Then Jesus comes along, proclaiming the gospel, the good news of the kingdom, and essentially says, you don't need those things anymore. I am your identity marker. I'm your identity now. You no longer need those things you used to base your sense of confidence in who you are on. Faith in Jesus is all you need, Paul says. But some of the Jewish believers are thinking, that can't be right. I mean, we believe that Jesus is the Messiah, but these things are important. We've always had them. We've always trusted in them. They've always been important to our identity as God's people. You can't just throw them out. And Jesus is essentially saying, the gospel is saying, we're not throwing them out, but they're fulfilled now. They, they're completed in him. Let me give you an analogy. Imagine you work for NASA. And you've gone to MIT, you've gone through all the background checks and the security clearance and screenings and training, and you get your top secret NASA identity badge. This is the Chapel Street staff badge. It doesn't mean that much. But, you know, just pretend with me. Your, your NASA security badge, right? You've got it with you. And you, you, you can get into all the top secret labs. And then one day you come to work, and your badge doesn't work. And the security guard says, oh, no, we're not using those anymore. Those don't matter. You don't need that anymore. You'd think, what do you mean you don't need that? I, you know how hard I worked to get this? You know how m many years I struggled and labored to get this? This means something. That's kind of how I think these Judaizers felt. They didn't understand what Jesus is really saying to them. And Paul says, watch out for those dogs. You know why he says that? Is because some of them were saying, you Gentile converts are dogs, lesser than the Jewish converts. Now, in our culture, dogs are cute. They put them in every commercial. There's a fuzzy dog in every car commercial, shoe commercial, or whatever commercial. In the first century, dogs were not cute. It was not a compliment to call somebody a dog. It was an insult. Paul is saying, those who call you dogs because you don't have these things don't understand Jesus. He flips it around on them. So let's ask, what, what's your spiritual ID badge? What are you putting your confidence in? Notice in verses 3 and 4, Paul uses the word confidence three times. Three times he talks about 
where they put their confidence and reasons for our confidence. This is the Greek word pepoithesis. It, it means to place trust in or reliance or to be persuaded um, of trustworthiness. It comes from a root word that means to be persuaded someone or something is trustworthy. So you might think of confidence that we're going to talk about here in this context. That which you are persuaded is trustworthy enough to build your life on. What are those things you're persuaded, you're convinced, this is worth staking my life on? I build my life on this, my identity on this. That's, spiritually speaking, your confidence. So where have you placed your confidence? This is what Paul is really getting at, warning about placing our confidence in the wrong things. Let me read to you verses 4 through 6 again of Philippians chapter 3. Paul gives this list of where he used to put his confidences. He says, Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. He's saying, you want to go there? Okay, we can go there. I am circumcised on the eighth day. Probably not going to make your list, but we'll explain why that was important to Paul. Of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Paul's saying, okay, look, you want to compare resumes, spiritual resumes? I've got it covered. I can go there with you. Name it. I can trump, I can beat any of you. He lays out this list of misplaced confidences before he met Jesus. Now, I want to walk through Paul's list of misplaced confidences And as we do this, I want you to think of your own. I want you to think of your own misplaced confidences. Those things which you have been persuaded are worth building your life on, and they're not. First, the confidence in national identity. Paul says he's circumcised on the eighth day, and that he's an an Israelite, meaning he belongs to the people of God. His national identity. I'm of Israel. God's chosen people. I'm one of them. Today, I'm an American. Proud to be an American. Listen, I am grateful for our country. I love our country. I do not take for granted the freedoms we enjoy here. They're not the same all around the world. And our freedoms can be fragile. But my confidence, your confidence, should not be in the United States of America. It should be in Jesus. I'm not persuaded that being an American is trustworthy enough to build my life on. Do you understand the difference? I love our country. I pray for our country. I want to be faithful and a good citizen of our country. But I'm not building my life on that. I'm not sticking my soul on that. Throughout history, wherever the followers of Jesus have misplaced their confidence in their national identity, it goes terribly wrong every time. In the Roman Empire, in Europe, Throughout history, it's gone bad for Christ followers when they misplace their confidence in their national identity. Second, confidence in family heritage. Paul says, I'm in the tribe of Benjamin. This is his tribe, his people, his lineage, where he comes from. These are my people. I belong to them. Literally speaking, his tribe. Tribalism is rampant today, and you might not say that it's your biological family that you put your confidence in, but for many of us, it's our tribe, our people. These, these are my people. We share the same values. Now, again, it's not bad to have a sense of your tribe or my people. That's not a bad thing, but it's not our confidence. It's not I'm not persuaded that that's worth building my entire life on, you see. Number three, confidence in ethnic identity. Paul says, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. This is Jewish culture and heritage. It's not a bad thing for Paul. The gospel does not erase ethnic or racial uniquenesses or differences. When you become a follower of Jesus, it doesn't wipe away your history and your background. That's not what he's saying. The diversity of God's kingdom is is beautiful. It's a many-colored kingdom. We celebrate that. We should. But my confidence, that which I'm persuaded is worth building my life on, is not in my ethnicity, not in my racial identity, not in my family identity, not in my tribal identity, not in my national identity. This is equally true for ethnic minorities and for those that are the majority in culture. We all need to set that aside and place our confidence in Jesus. We are still today feeling it in in our country right now. We're still dividing over this. 
We're still doing violence over it. National, ethnic, racial, religious identities. This is not just an American problem. Four, confidence in religious pedigree. Paul says, in regard to the law, faultless. I was a Pharisee. Pharisees often get a bad rap in the the Bible. When you read about Pharisees, it's not often complimentary. Jesus is often challenging them or they're challenging him. He sometimes is calling them out. He calls them brood of vipers and and hypocrites. And so the Pharisees don't often get a good name. And when we use it today, you Pharisee, we usually mean a hypocrite. But can we at least say this? The Pharisees were serious about keeping God's law. They took that very seriously, so seriously that it became a kind of legalistic self-righteousness that ended up being toxic spiritually. But it started with a desire to be faithful to God's law, to keep it. Five, confidence in moral record. Thinking that I, you know, I try hard to live a good life. Paul says, As regards to righteousness that comes from the obedience to the law, I was faultless. How could he say that, faultless? That sounds like an overstatement. Paul's saying, I was so serious about this. I did not break the legal code, technically speaking. Paul would come to Jesus and later call himself the chief of all sinners, which means he recognized that even though he kept the external law, his heart wasn't right. I think many of us think that our moral record, if I could present it to God, you know, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm good enough, not perfect, but good enough, I give God my record, and he looks at it and goes, well, you know, on the whole, you're better than that guy, and you're better than her, so I guess I'll bless you. That is not the gospel. There's no confidence in your moral record. Let me give you just briefly three indicators, three little soul tells, if you will, uh, to know if, where, if your confidence is misplaced. Number one, it's never enough. It always leaves you empty. It's never enough. There's no assurance and fulfillment. It's a treadmill, you know? I gotta keep running and running and earning. Number two, it makes you very critical of others. There's a lot of comparison going on. If you have false confidence, it's us and them all the time because they aren't like us. And number three, it leads to division and separation. Eventually, false confidences bring you to the place where it's like, well, we... We can't be together. We have to divide. We find ourselves excluding and exploiting others whenever our confidence is placed any place other than Jesus. So you see, Paul's saying, look, look, I check all the boxes in my spiritual resume, and yet it's empty. And really, if you think about it, all of those things that we put our confidence in, they're really human inventions. Family heritage, moral record, religious pedigree, uh, accomplishment, 401k, business success. Do you know what one of mine has been? And it's during COVID that God revealed this to me. My confidence has been in my confidence. Does that sound strange? Let me explain. I've always, I'm used to kind of knowing what to do, or at least faking it and convincing myself I know what to do. And pride of myself, you know, I'm not perfect, but I'm, I can lead. I can make decisions. In the last seven months, I've had to get used to not knowing what to do a lot. Maybe you can relate to that. And feeling kind of lost at times. And God almost saying to my heart, that's where I want you. Because now you can put your confidence back in me. You didn't see it, Jeff, but it's been in the wrong place. You've got your misplaced confidences too. I know you do. I've got mine. And Paul is saying, look, these, these things are made up. They're fabricated. You know, when, when, you remember when your kids are little and everybody gets a trophy because you don't want anybody to feel bad? And so if, if somebody gets, a, if there's a bunch of awards given out and there's a couple of kids that don't get them, you sort of make some awards up. Like I, I worked at the camp council. We always did this. Made it make, we want everybody to get a ribbon, so we'll make up a bunch of ribbons. You know, like the best, you know, the good personal hygiene ribbon. You know, the smells pretty good ribbon, whatever. You just make up a bunch of awards. For, in fact, my daughter, when she was in her first basketball camp, a Doug Bruno basketball camp, because she was really tall and sort of athletic, they put her with all the older girls. And so she played like three grades up because she was tall. And so she, her team didn't win, and she didn't get any awards. And she saw her, her classmates got a bunch of trophies because they were playing at their own age level. And she was so depressed about that. So here's what I did. And to this day, I don't know if this is a good idea or a bad idea. But as her dad, this is what I decided to do. 
I made her an award. <laughs> I made this trophy. You, you, I don't know if you can see this. I, I took one of my son's little trophies and I put her name over top of it, Hannah Frazier, and it's called the Totally Awesome at Everything Award. And her name's on it. <laughs> Isn't that great? So she still has it, which apparently means that I guess she, it meant a lot to her. And this is cute when you're a kid, I suppose. But when you become an adult, the truth is, many of us are still making up, making up awards in our lives to make ourselves feel good. So propping up ourselves in some false confidence. And Paul is trying to deconstruct that for us here. Let me read to you verses 7 through 9, where Paul describes how worthless these false confidences really are. He says, But whatever gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. By the way, that word loss is a financial term. It means a bad deal. It means a a forfeit, a financial loss. He means move it to the loss column. Verse uh, verse 8, What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. These three verses are so, so powerful for us if you're paying attention. Paul says, of all the things I put my confidence in before, I I consider them all lost. I lose them all in comparison to Jesus. In fact, everything... All things, whatever it is for you, whatever's on your list, is garbage, he says. The Greek word used there for garbage, some of you know this, it's, it's commonly talked about, is the Greek word skubalon. No English translators can bring themselves to put what it actually means. They write, ref, they write refuse, filth, garbage. The word literally means excrement, dung, human excrement, sewage. That's what Paul says. He's not saying your family is dung. He's saying in comparison to Jesus, even the best things in life, they're, by comparison, rubbish, filth, refuse, dung. Stack it all up, Paul says on one side, and put Christ on the other, and there's no comparison. There's just no comparison to the overwhelming, incomparable, incomprehensible gain of Jesus. Now next week, Pastor Brian is going to preach about this pursuit of our lives. But Paul's talking about a single-minded focus, a, a life pursuit, a passion about knowing Christ. But here's the thing. Paul does not lose these things in a vacuum. These things don't disappear in order that he can gain Christ, just that they'll just go away. So I would ask this question, what things must you lose in order to gain more of Christ? What do you have to lose to gain more of him? This is the question of us all, for us all. You cannot gain both. You cannot hold on to those things, those false confidences, and gain Christ. You can only have him. And when you have him, those things find their proper place in your heart. Misplaced confidences do not disappear on their own. They must be displaced and replaced by a greater confidence. This is so important that you get this. Those things we place our confidence in, our identity in, they're deep in us. You don't just wake up one morning and decide, you know, I think I'm going to throw away all the things I've built my life on. I'm going to just totally change my identity and all my sense of security. They're deeply rooted in us. They must be displaced. How does that happen? The secret, I think, here is when Paul talks about righteousness. He says, there was a righteousness that comes through the law, keeping the law, being good enough. That's what all of his confidence was about. Then there's a righteousness that comes from God through faith in Jesus, and they're not the same. You can't have both of them. And one is a false righteousness. By the way, righteousness, another churchy word, it just means right standing, to be justified right with someone. How does a man or woman get made right with God? How do you stand right before him? National identity, ethnic identity, moral record, religious pedigree, all the good things you've done, or faith in Christ and Christ alone. 
Paul says, my whole life was built on these things, and I realized they're empty. They don't do it. This is, this is what displaces and replaces our false confidence, knowing that in Christ we're approved, we're free. Remember how we started this? We started this with Paul talking about what it means to rejoice. He said, rejoice in the Lord. It's a safeguard for you. I want to try to give you a little example or a little analogy of what it means to rejoice. And I've chosen to use a juice box. I don't think I've used a juice box in years, okay? This one I, I went and bought. It's Apple and Eve, so you can see why I chose that one. Apple and Eve. I think what happens to us in our lives is this. We confuse what joy comes through with what joy comes from. Paul, I think, is saying to us, don't confuse where joy comes from with what it comes through. Here's how it works, right? You take the little straw, which is the best part of the juice box, is the straw. I was going to buy Capri Sun, but I always stick it through both sides, so this was safer, right? You put the straw right in there, and you... Ah, apple juice. It's nice juice. It's so good. A little sweeter than I'm used to, but it's very good, right? And, and then, then what happens is, you, if you de- di- disconnect the straw, what happens? Well, a little juice left, a little sip, but now it's empty. And in our lives, we like, curse you, straw. You've let me down. I realize you're hollow. You're empty inside. There's nothing there, right? And we, just, we're, and we're, we wonder what happened. Paul is saying to rejoice is to re means again, means to go back again and reconnect to where joy comes from. So many of us are, are, are like walking around with empty straws and there's nothing there. When Paul says rejoice in the Lord, rejoice in the Lord. Put your joy back in the source of where it comes from. Go back to that place when you recognize that all I was striving for, all I ever wanted, all I tried to prop my life up on, all the false trophies I put my confidence in, they're they're garbage to me, and I realize that I have everything my heart desires in Jesus. I'm accepted, I'm approved, I'm loved in him. Put yourself back in the source of joy, Paul is saying. That's what it means to rejoice. So when, when we come and sing songs, we're rejoicing, we're reconnecting, we're coming back to the source of our joy. When we come to church and open God's word, we're rejoicing, we're reconnecting, we're plugging ourselves back into his word. When we pray, when we fellowship, whether it's virtually or in person, that's what we're doing. And when we come to celebrate communion, which we're going to do right now, we're rejoicing, we're reconnecting. What a perfect way for us then to wrap this up by coming back together to the Lord's table. And through these simple elements of bread and cup, rejoicing in the Lord, rejoicing in what he has done for us. So I'm going to give you just a moment while I pray to get the elements ready. Get your bread and cup ready with your family or whoever's with you around your table, on the couch, on the bedside, wherever you are. Let's pray. God, as we pause now to acknowledge these symbols, simple things really, bread and cup, are powerful reminders of the joy we have in you. And Lord Jesus, we do, we rejoice in what you have done for us. We recognize the depth of our sin and the greater infinite depth of your love. We rejoice that you are our identity. You are all we need. We ask you to forgive us for putting our confidence in all these false things, all the idols of our culture and of our own heart. Lord, we cast them aside once more and we rejoice in you. Now let's take the bread together. And I remind you that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it, he passed it to his disciples and he said to them, this is my body and it's given for you. Eat this in his memory. The Bible says that when they had finished eating, Jesus poured out a cup. said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood 
shed for the forgiveness of your sins. And that every time we together eat bread and drink this cup, we proclaim his death and resurrection. Let's rejoice in the Lord together.